nothing is impossible. That's what I've learned. I, the way I got into um, philanthropy, so I, I, was, I said before, I was working in a school and um, had all of these ideas. And in part, I was convinced I had good ideas. And in part, I was a smart ass that wanted to prove people wrong. And uh, so whatever the motivation, I got the white pages phone book out and looked up Dame Elizabeth Murdoch. So I was living in Mornington. She was in Lang Warren. I figured we're virtually neighbours. You know, she needs to know what I'm doing and what I want to do. So I wrote to her and uh, within a week, she'd sent me $5,000 and a personal promise to get every one of those ideas off the ground. And what I, I learned a couple of things from that really fast. I learned I could spend other people's money well. Uh, and less good with mine, but spend her money well. And the other thing I learned is that her money would come and go, but her name was unbelievable. Because I could pick up the phone to the local council or the chamber of commerce or anyone, and they didn't know who I was, but I could say, in partnership with Dame Elizabeth Murdoch, you know, we're working on a project you might be interested in. They take your call, they'll meet with you, they'll let you send your application. And I started to learn that it's not just about me and it's not about an idea that I've got or a program I want to run. It's quite often about identifying people that have a huge platform and a lot of respect and getting them to become champions. Because I guarantee if you had four or five Dame Elizabeth Murdoch type figures, whether they're putting in your seven million or not, you'd be surprised how much leverage can be created from that. And so quite often, you know, the, the number one rule in fundraising is if you want advice, ask for money. If you want money, ask for advice. And uh, so that, that would be what I would leave you with. I just need a number and I'll ask <laughs> yeah. First of all, I think we are not doing anywhere near enough uh, in terms of, you know, meaningful education and meaningful pathways uh, into employment. Um, so I, it's hard to answer. Like, do, I, do I see I, everything that I've said about being able to contribute and participate uh, in the world in the 21st century is not talking about any one group of young people more or less than any other. And so a young person with any type of disability, I think all of that is equally true for. And if we genuinely were focused on equity and had a system of education that promised every single young person, no matter what, you know, will have the opportunity to you know, have an excellent education that genuinely meets their needs, then there's no, there's no exception to that. Um, I think we're a long way off being able to deliver that. It'll be interesting on Monday with the Gonski review, you know, the government finally coming out with some <laughs> findings on that uh, or, or you know, actions on that. Um, they really obviously need to sort out what's happening with how disability is funded in schools. And from what I've heard, that'll be one of the first things that uh, you know, is addressed through the Gonski recommendations um, and the government's response to it. Uh, Stella, who you know, I told you about, is uh, a fierce advocate of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And I've done a lot of lobbying of uh, politicians and other community members uh, alongside her about why a scheme like that really has to be introduced um, you know, very quickly in Australia if we genuinely uh, you know, want to make sure we're giving young people the opportunity to you know, participate fully. So I don't think there's an easy answer, but you know, whenever I've got the opportunity, I certainly push as much as I can, but I don't know if there was something more that I can say. Two, two things. One is I think if you had an answer, you'd be you know, a very high profile person in education because everyone would want you. Um, just about every school I go in, the, the common question that I'm asked is, you know, what can you suggest about better ways to engage with parents? Or how do you really get um, parents to really value learning and to value what, what happens now, but also what could happen in and around a school environment? And it's really hard. Um, and I don't, I don't have a single you know, um, you know, one-dimensional answer for how you actually engage parents better. I know some good research and I know some schools that have come up with some interesting ways of doing it that I'm always happy to put you in touch with. The other side is how does the school tell its own story? And, and I talk a lot about schools, but take that in the you know, learning institutions in the broader sense. Um, I, I mentioned very briefly before that I think there's a PR challenge. And I think, you know, and I'll use a school as an example, that you know, how do we talk about the school's success? You know, because we, you're going to have the league tables, you're going to have all of those awful comparisons and all of that that comes out. But how does your school or how does your learning institution tell the story of its own success and what do you really value? Um, and I think that's... I'm not saying that schools... Um, that should be the role of schools to you know, tell that story, but I think it's a reality. 
And I think that if you, I, I see so many schools that do amazing things to keep young people connected and engaged and find meaningful pathways for them into a whole range of different things. But if that doesn't reflect in you know, retention, if that doesn't reflect in uh, you know, academic performance, then the, the reputation of the school can be it's a failure. I've seen schools that have a huge um, refugee population of young people um, that have you know, learnt to speak English within 12 months, um, you know, being assessed in the same way as everyone else in the school and in the neighbouring schools. And we do nothing seriously that takes a lot of those other factors and a lot of the value-add things into account. So if, I think if the, if the school is not coming up with ways to actually tell that story better and differently, it's really hard to change the perception of that school as being you know, the rubbish school or the second option or if you can't get into the other one or something. We need to be more proactive about you know, what do we want to focus on and how do we tell it. But that's, that's a pretty specific skill set that doesn't exist in most schools. So it's a really, you know, it's a catch-22. Mm. We're too busy banning phones. You know, switch, we're too, yeah. We've got a lot to learn about being comfortable with a lot of these devices. Um, and I'm not saying we'd be irresponsible, but there's a way to you know, be proactive and use them and make the most of the technology available to us within a you know, responsible way. Um, and the other thing with all of those examples, um, if you look at who's actually started, you know, Facebook or any of these you know, huge entrepreneurial things, quite often they're dropouts. You know, they're, you know, again, go back to the model that we said before about what makes a person successful. Um, it's hard to dispute now that they're all incredibly successful. Um, you know, but again, we need a really broader frame for thinking about that.